<laughs> okay, it started. And the recording has um, started. Hopefully, I haven't made any mistake. So a big, big thank to Emmy. As you can see, uh, she is uh, helping us in the room. I owe her badly, as I owe badly to uh, Claudio. Um, this will cost dinners, drinks, etc. You don't want to know. Uh, but many, many, many thanks. Um, this is not what people should be doing. Um, don't get any wrong view um, is the other way around is the supervisor that is at the service of the person who supervised this is an exception not to be repeated <laughs> having said that apologies for the mess and apologies for the uh, extraordinary circumstances in which this is happening having said that thanks to claudio and to emmy we are able to do this uh, meaning that we can still uh, work on these uh, lectures and we're not going to uh, lose um, the allocated time. As you may or may not remember, the lecture will also be this afternoon, meaning that you will have a lot of uh, information today uh, from me. Uh, we'll have some time at the end of this morning uh, lecture for some Q&A and we will uh, regain uh, interactions uh, reconvene in the afternoon at what I think, uh, let me double check, is two o'clock Italian time. Let me double check that I don't say it's silly. Yes. yes, so ordinary uh, time of this lecture this morning. I'll see you again uh, 2 p.m. Italian time this afternoon for anyone who wishes to know about the second half uh, of our topic. Time to do some work now. And in this case too, hopefully the technical support of our university and Emmy in the room will help us to show the slides. One more step and I'm with you. Right, I can see that the slides are up uh, on the big screen, all okay. So this is the second uh, topic, the second lecture of the course. Let me remind you a little bit about what we did last week. The topics we covered last week were organized under the general term methodology. We did explore a few content uh, which were not entirely methodological that belong to the what rather than the how. Having said that, I introduced a number of conceptual distinctions, some tools, some ways of doing analysis. Remember the level of abstractions, the distinction between soft and hard headaches and so forth. I hope that those topics uh, that we covered, the methodologically um, uh, oriented uh, content that I share with you will turn out to be useful in the following lectures. This is really the first uh, lecture that we'll be discussing uh, when we will be discussing a particular area of interest for digital ethics or digital philosophy at large. A quick premise, um, I hope you will see some friends, some uh, family uh, familiar uh, resembling uh, slides, because we will, are going to use some of the contents that I shared in the past three weeks. So a bit about deja vu uh, is not a bug, it's a feature, uh, it's meant to be. I also decided to uh, introduce in the um, uh, this particular lecture a, a few slides that are identical to the uh, slides that I show you last week, just to remind you about specific topics. Let's do some work now. So uh, what you uh, have in the title is an attempt to synthesize what we're going to discuss today, uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, more uh, likely than not, and perhaps if we don't have enough time, uh, even tomorrow morning. How 
the digital revolution has changed our way of understanding reality, meaning what surrounds us. There will be a link or a hook to a very similar but slightly different topic. When we talk about understanding reality, we normally talk about the reality, as I said, surrounding us, uh, our experience of the physical world, the virtual world. But there's, of course, the complementary, fundamental uh, area of what is there, which is us. So imagine this lecture being the ontological, meaning reality-oriented side of a twofold analysis. How the digital revolution has changed our own conception of the world, the physical, the virtual reality surrounding us, and how the digital uh, revolution has changed our conception of ourselves, meaning you know, who we are, who we can be, how we conceptualize ourselves. Even more broadly, you can see this one and two, digital uh, revolution changing our conception of the world, plus changing our conception of ourselves. Take that as a package. Well, what's el what else there is there to understand? Well, of course, it's not just the world, it's not just us, it's also how we interact with the world and how we interact among ourselves. So one, two, three, four, these are the four topics that we will be covering one way or another in the following lectures. How we change the way we conceptualize the world, how we are changing how we conceptualize ourselves. This is part of ontology. And moving to how we also uh, uh, upgrade our understanding of the interactions with the world and the interactions among ourselves. Interactions with the world uh, will uh, probably take um, just a, a minor role. Uh, it will be a topic spread across the different lectures. It's called knowledge, information, uh, the, the, or uh, actions or interactions with, etc. Knowledge of our interactions among ourselves, that's politics, that's ethics. So imagine this um, block uh, of lectures organized in terms of ontology, understanding the world, ontology, understanding the self, and then epistemology, understanding our interactions with the world, plus philosophy of politics, understanding interactions among ourselves. This is a huge immense area to cover. Of course, I will be able only to touch upon a few um, significant uh, elements in this huge, huge uh, continent uh, in front of us. I hope that the hints here and there will be helpful to enable each of you in this uh, call, in this uh, uh, online lectures, to pursue more interesting topics closer to your interest. So we focus now on understanding the world outside ourselves, not just about ourselves, but what the world looks like uh, there. Now, in uh, the usual uh, structure, these are the sections that we're going to cover. I'll start with a general comment about science and common sense, how these two have uh, lost sight of each other. has been a long uh, divorce, if you like, uh, using the usual metaphor. Uh, it goes back to the scientific revolution. At some point, two forms of knowledge have developed and they seem to be no longer friend with each other. How we understand the world scientifically and how we perceive, understand the world in terms of our ordinary experience. To do some real work and try to resolve that tension between science and common sense, Imagine the question, what is reality? According to science or according to common sense, not really compatible. We need to go back to that particular tool which I recommended uh, strongly last week, and I cannot recommend uh, more uh, this week. This time we will, uh, we will apply that uh, methodology, the levels of abstraction, and I hope to show you why it is so powerful and why it's so helpful in this particular debate. We're going back to the distinction between systems and models, uh, again, something that I start outlining uh, last week, and how we can build models of the world in terms of 
entities and relations linking those entities. Finally, a lot of uh, that will lead to a new different way of conceiving philosophy as um, uh, conceptual design and how that slowly uh, merges with a new conception of the self, which is the topic of the next lecture. So with this uh, general scheme uh, in front of us, um, let's start from uh, unplugging or revising some ordinary commonsensical views of what is out there. Perception, our perception of the world is very narrow. Uh, oh, by the way, what I'm going to tell you in the next three or four slides is Wikipedia level, uh, nothing particularly new, uh, things that we should know from high school, not, not university level. Uh, what you see in front of you uh, is the uh, whole um, range of waves, short and long, that are out there. Uh, I like to pick up one or two, for example, uh, look at the top uh, black side microwaves, well, exactly what you have in your kitchen, um, radar, uh, radio, um, but also ultraviolet, um, gamma rays, uh, things that are a little bit more uh, mysterious uh, for our everyday experience. Now, this narrow little band is the visible light, and that's what we can see if our eyes are working properly. The evolution, uh, in our case, has provided us with the ability to look at the world through visible light. As you know, we might be working uh, maybe with some more ra radar kind of uh, uh, perception, uh, bat and everything else, or just by noise or perceiving waves. If you are a deep, deep, deep sea fish, you don't need visible light because there is no visible light. So uh, fish at that depth in the complete darkness or the deepest uh, side of the sea don't have eyes. eyes. They don't see because there's nothing to see. So nature hasn't quite developed that particular way of perceiving the world. So perception uh, in terms of seeing the world is very narrow. We see only a fraction of a fraction of what is available out there. Imagine if the world had uh, given us uh, the ability to um, hear, for example, uh, different sounds. This is another uh, typical way of uh, start unplugging our mammalian conception of what the world is like. Ask anybody in the, in, in the street, in, in fact ask even some philosophers, and say, oh, the world is out well, there, what you can kick and see and hear, etc. Well, um, for elephants, uh, the world is much bigger than ours, uh, they have infrasound. We are here, uh, a very narrow uh, human auditory field, but cats and dogs, uh, of course, have a much wider um, uh, range. They can uh, work with ultrasounds, and so can dolphins and bats. So the world, according to this particular chart, which again is not even Wikipedia, this is from uh, uh, a secondary school uh, kind of uh, textbook appears very differently to an elephant, to a mole, to a cat, to a dog, to a bat, to a dolphin, or to a human being. What happens is that, and I'll come back to this in the future, uh, we have a specific body. The body we have is an interface in terms of ability to perceive, to capture signals from uh, the uh, source, which is outside us, in terms of sounds, heat, waves, um, light, touch, um, taste, and so forth, smell. If we had had a different kind of body, we would have survived. Look at the cat and dogs or other deep sea uh, fish. But the commonsensical view of what is out there would be hugely different. In fact, it is, it's unimaginable to some extent more in terms of uh, changing our perception of the world. Um, uh, we covered this briefly when I spoke about the four revolutions. Remember, we're not at the center of the universe. Well, it's way more um, sort of disturbing. Not only we're not, but we're traveling through the universe at a speed that we clearly do not perceive. That is a, a rough calculation of the speed at which we are moving right now. Almost 500,000 miles per hour. Now, 500 miles per hour is is fast. 
Why are we traveling so uh, fast? Well, f first of all, the, the Earth is um, spinning on itself, so that's a lot of uh, movement. Then it's going around the sun, and that you know, adds to the uh, how much we move around this uh, space uh, called universe. But then the sun is also uh, moving uh, the solar system through the galaxy, and the galaxy is moving. So everybody's moving. <laughs> and in a world in which everybody's dancing and dancing in different directions, the spins, the speed, of the, uh, the shift, and so on, add to an immense uh, speed of uh, change uh, of location, uh, which of course we don't perceive. And it has taken millennia to come to that conclusion and we are not digesting it. The moment you leave this room, uh, whether virtually or physically, we will go back to like an elastic band to our perception of the world as what we see, what we hear, and of course, fix sitting on this chair going nowhere. Uh, also, in terms of what is out, out there, according to science, um, uh, a long, long time ago, when the universe was super young, uh, only uh, a few hundred thousand years old, uh, which is nothing uh, in, you know, in a billion years sort of uh, uh, age, there were quite a number of atoms. Uh, calculated 12%. Um, dark matter was mm, there, but uh, uh, quite uh, a lot. No dark energy, or whatever that may, may mean uh, for the scientist. Um, it's a way of making sense of a lot of experiments. Now, if you compare the picture below to the one above, um, the universe is losing atoms. It's like an old gentleman uh, losing hair. Um, it's getting bold, uh, and uh, it is increasingly made of uh, dark matter, dark energy, dark something. So even the perception of the world as something solid out there that you can kick and shift and chew, uh, not so much, uh, certainly not in terms of substance, the solidity of the pen you're holding in your hands, the keyboard you are hitting. As a matter of fact, it is much more energy uh, than stuff. Now, these are all uh, ways by a philosopher to uh, uh, horrify physicists. Of course, uh, physics doesn't speak in those terms and is just a, a simple-minded philosophical way of translating that into some sort of ordinary day uh, language. But if I can put it uh, dramatically and kind of uh, over simplistically, the world is empty. Uh, atoms, as we know, not only they're not there, uh, very few, less than 5%, but atoms also are made mostly of empty space, um, or which is a way, bad, bad, bad way of putting it. They're made of um, uh, fields, of course, uh, but there's nothing you can actually obey hard to kick something. That's why the CERN consumes so much energy uh, to uh, make sure that uh, particles hit other particles. Uh, it will be like trying to uh, hit uh, a bird uh, with a stone uh, in an empty sky. You know, it's not full of uh, birds, there's only one and you have very few chances of hitting it. So, I told you at the beginning, which picture should we endorse? Or do we just live this uh, schizophrenic life, which is what we do these days? Oh, on the one hand, there's science that tells us we're moving, there's nothing out there, it's all energy, mostly. Um, uh, we have all the senses we have, but we have this body, we are so um, entrapped in this particular perception. And yet, as you know, humanity develops its ability to think, to reason, to infer, to experiment, to force nature to tell us more and more about itself, uh, Francis Bacon uh, really had rather dramatic and violent you know, pictures about this forcing, almost to torturing reality, nature, to give uh, away its secrets. How do we square that with our common sense? Is it just a matter of saying on the one hand, on the other hand, and well, so be it? Well, normally, uh, if you speak to some scientists, this is the picture you get. Now, I put there the uh, uh, Italian version because of Sergio Leone who was uh, the director of uh, that famous movie. But there's a quote from that movie which is uh, common to many languages, English included. When a man with a 45 meets a man with a rifle, the man with a pistol will be a dead man. 
you know, the 45. That's an old Mexican proverb, and it's true. Now, this is the bad guy, you see him top right here, uh, who is talking to Clint Eastwood, uh, the good guy. As you know, it doesn't end well for the guy with a uh, rifle. So it is not true. But this is the scene we are seeing here. The scientist, uh, a caricature of a scientist who wants to be uh, extremely reductionist and wants to get rid of all common sense, will tell you, look, I have the rifle of science. You have the 45 of common sense. When you meet science, you're there, man. Believe it or not, there are people who actually will tell you this. Um, in fact, there is a, a famous scientist, uh, quite uh, popular in Italy these days, who will tell you, for example, that time does not exist. And try to explain that to anyone who has uh, lost a dear person the other day. Whatever time is, whatever people may say, um, that is irrecoverable, is irreversible, and there's nothing in the universe that will ever convince anyone, no, no matter what science says, that time doesn't exist. There's a certain kind of time, the physics time, that does not exist. But it's not Heidegger time. It is not the time of the Bible. Uh, remember uh, the uh, famous phrase, there's a time for everything, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. Uh, there's a time for hate and the time of love. I go by memory. But essentially the experiential time. What is missing in that particular picture is the ability to articulate different ways and kinds of discourse on reality, time included. So forget about the uh, view that the scientific rifle always wins against the 45 commonsensical um, approach. The truth is that there are different ways of doing this. And you can start seeing why we need to talk about levels of abstraction. We need to be at the same time, however, careful about relativism. These are the two um, extremes we need to avoid. On the one hand, I just show you uh, the idea that one of the two is going to win. Is that a common sense? Is that a, uh, the gun or the rifle? Is that a common sense or science? And normally these days, science is seen as the winning uh, so, uh, competitor. If you are in doubt, listen to the scientist, which is absolutely not a good idea. Uh, don't get me wrong. And yet, how do we square that with our commonsensical view of, say, feeling pain when you bump into something? Well, people may say, oh, no, look, there's all empty vacuum there, all just the energy, etc. But the pain is real. Well, the alternative is to move from absolutism, so one and only one picture of the universe is correct, to relativism. Oh, there are a thousand pictures and anyone, uh, an example, is free to choose. What you uh, lose of the absolute picture is the ability to say when things are right and when things are wrong. It just all depends. What you gain, of course, is some kind of uh, tolerance. Relativists uh, can be tolerant of any view, uh, including the fact, for example, that uh, well, the whole story about the vaccine and coronavirus, it was just an invention uh, of great powers or some uh, conspiracy or the Chinese um, trying to do something or the, um, the CIA, etc. Or people say, well, you know, it depends. You know, Earth is round, it's flat, it doesn't matter. It's a relative uh, point of view, my opinion, your opinion. But well, we definitely want to avoid that too, if possible. So we want to be pluralist allowing for different views without being relativist. We want to avoid both the absolute view, either the, the rifle or the gun, and the relativistic view. Uh, well, any uh, so, uh, tool will do, any view will uh, succeed. How do we do that? Well, I started telling you that uh, we need this way of understanding that our step into our approach to conceptualizing the world is to be understood much better. You need to avoid exactly that. Uh, simple minded view. Now, you must remember this picture. It's just a quick reminder for those of you who were uh, having a coffee at the time. The map of the London Underground, another map of the London Underground, they're both OK. It depends on what you are using them for. There is no real map of the underground as such. The unique, only, absolute, final, ultimate, the one that no one can contest in terms of what for. 
Of course, there is something out there on the underground and something called the system that we want to model. But whether one model, say the uh, commonsensical model of the universe or the scientific model of the universe is correct or not, depends on what questions you are asking, what for you are developing a model, what's the purpose of the model. Now, this means that we need to understand abstraction way more clearly. This is also a reminder, I told you already, so quickly, abstraction as information hiding. Now, this is when we design things. Remember, the distinction we made in the past, I will come back to this uh, again. There's a way of modeling a system which presupposes the system out there. Something is out there and uh, you want to capture its structure, its features and so on. But what we're talking about here is the other way around. Nothing is there and we want to build the Londo underground. Imagine you are building the underground right now. What kind of uh, design, structure, model, blueprint you want to have? Well, maybe the blueprint will be this. Again, let me be clear. There is no Londo underground. You're building it. This is the blueprint. Would this be a good print? Well, yes, if uh, you need to present this to uh, a, a bunch of um, uh, shareholders who want to know, will it be useful? Would it be easy to navigate, et cetera, et cetera. But it will be totally useless in terms of actually telling the engineers where to put the tracks. So back to us um, in programming, uh, this abstraction as information hiding is the process of making inaccessible details of an object or function, and usually in order to reduce complexity. We will be talking about complexity in the future. At the moment, just take it as a, a simple word, a commonsensical uh, idea. Now, back to the, uh, and you should not see anything uh, at the moment, this is white. Suppose you join a conversation and people are talking about a mysterious object. You didn't hear, you are at a party. You don't know what they're talking about. Anne is a buyer. She has a that level of abstraction and she observes that uh, this particular object has anti-theft device installed, is kept garage, we're not in use, and has had only a single owner. You start getting a sense of what that could be. But then Ben replies that uh, the engine is not the original one. Uh, its body has been recently repainted and all the leather parts of A1. So, oh, okay. Uh, I can start guessing they might be talking about something I know. Then you hear more. Now, this is a conversation at a party, you know, a drink, something else, and Carol, uh, who is an insurer, says, oh, look, but um, yeah, the old engine consumed too much. Um, well, this system has a stable market value, but the spare parts are really expensive. What are they talking about? I'll give you five seconds to guess, and then, a bit of a synthesis. These are three level of abstractions. And consists of observables for security, metal storage, and owner history. Imagine this as big containers, now the labels, and the values that go into it. Remember the example when I told you buying a secondhand car and uh, the actual figure, the number, the Arabic numbers are the variable, and the type is the currency. $5,000, the dollar is the type, the 5,000 is the specific uh, uh, variable, and the type variable is what makes, by accumulating enough of them, the model of that particular car. Benz, observable for engine condition, external body, etc. Carol, uh, observable for, for running cost, the market, etc. Now, can you guess what that is? I provide this example so that you understand what pluralism means. All that would fit a model bike. Completely, double check. But it would also fit a car. And it would fit an airplane, a small airplane. So at the end of the day, you have some constraints. It doesn't fit a cat. They're not talking about a cat. They're not talking about a house. But they might be talking about three different objects all fitting the descriptions provided by their models. In some context, um, when we say that uh, the uh, data, this is philosophy of science, the data in question, in this case, you have all the uh, bits in red on this slide, underdetermine 
the description of the model, it means that you have enough data to guess that the system you're talking about is such and such or so and so or blah, blah, blah. But the under determination by the data of the uh, particular system means that your model can fit more than one description. Of course, the conversation could carry on and it could say, for example, that this uh, particular object is flying. Well, at that point, you have enough data to fully determine the description of the system by that model. This is just to get slightly more acquainted with the idea of a level of abstraction. In each case, these three level of abstractions are complementary. And so here's another point, fundamental. Please never forget. Our abstraction, although the terminology is very unfortunate, it comes from computer science, not my fault, doesn't come in hierarchical structure. It is sometimes the case that the more data you have, the more precise, the more granular your model of the system becomes. Imagine as if we were uh, looking at an object uh, through a microscope, you can increasingly see more and more and more of that particular object. So you increase the granularity, the specificity of your model with respect to the system. But often the point is that uh, we're actually uh, looking at the uh, system from complementary points of views, or if you like, um, perspectives, interfaces. As I said, sometimes in sociology, unfortunately, people talk about lens. These are all very vague and loose ways of, of speaking. Level of structures is much more precise. You will see in a moment why we need the terminology to be more precise. So, slightly different example before moving to the next slide. Imagine a building and someone is uh, describing that building. The building is at the corner of the street. Someone describes it uh, in terms of historical value. Maybe it's an old building. Maybe the architect that, uh, designed that building is famous. Maybe it was restored in uh, 100 years ago, etc. A whole historical level of abstraction. But then someone could have a structural uh, understanding of that building in terms of utilities, in terms of stability, uh, etc. And someone else could have a model of their building in terms of economic value. Um, has he lost value? Can it be uh, let uh, easily? Um, can it be transformed into uh, a commercial um, uh, venue, etc.? Now, these three level of abstractions, the historical, archaeological, um, artistic view, the commercial, and so on, the structural, they're not one on top of each other. They're not hierarchical. So you have the object in front of you and you change perspective, you change level of abstraction about that uh, perspective. So a level consists of type variables. And when those type variables change, so does the system. Imagine, for example, that you look at the building through time and how it's getting um, more and more polluted uh, because of a uh, pollution around the building. The type variable, for example, of the color of the uh, facade is changing through time. The type remains the same, color of the facade, but the quality or the uh, figure, the variable of what are the specific uh, uh, values of that type changes through time, meaning that there is a transition in that system. We need to do a little bit more work, and this time I want to introduce um, a different example so that we can finally get in. Uh, uh, fully acquainted with this idea of level abstraction. You must be acquainted with this uh, super cheap technology, uh, either at home or you must have visited, say, a, um, a friend. Uh, it's available in a garage, uh, in a bank, etc. Motion detector. Um, you move close to it and something happens. Could open a door, uh, trigger an alarm, uh, turn on a light. In this case, we just uh, Assume that, for example, this motion detector turns on a light. It's installed in a garden. The garden is your space of observation. You're not talking about the house. You're not talking about someone else's garden. You're not talking about the street, the square, uh, the, the office. 
their space is your space of observation. Now let's assume that we have two different kinds of motion detectors. Two different kinds, two different levels of abstraction. Now in this case, type one has only one variable, movement. If something moves, the light goes on. The other uh, motion detector has two types, movement plus infrared radiation, normally translated into heat. If you haven't seen enough bad movies, uh, you know that this is normally what you get with uh, infrared um, goggles or some kind of apparatus that enables people to see objects in um, a night, in, in the dark. Uh, the kind of waves that you're picking up are no longer uh, the visible light, but you are picking up the infrared uh, radiations. Those radiations, uh, they are uh, um, uh, sent by any uh, body that has some heat, uh, like a human body, for example, are picked up by our technology. You need to have a particular interface, a level of abstraction, a particular kind of glasses, for example, to see those radiations, but you, you can, well, we can do that. Now, the uh, two um, motion detectors, therefore, they are observing a particular space, the space of observation, our garden, and they have two different uh, types. One, just movement, the other one, movement plus infrared radiation. What happens? Well, if you have this, these things, this is the uh, more abstract way of looking at this. So first of all, the big circle here is your garden. That's the space of observation. Imagine there are three objects, three are sufficient for the small uh, example that I'm providing you here. Three objects in this space of observation. Object number uh, one, object A, is a branch of a tree that is moving. Now, because it's moving, the level of abstraction that picks up movement will pick that up will see that as something that is in the garden. In other words, and mind, this is a fundamental uh, step. If you are a body, imagine that you are a kind of organism and you have only one way of sensing the universe. Does it move or does it not? It could be you know, a deep sea, dark uh, uh, place, fish. If it moves, Eat it, if it doesn't, move on. Well, Dips picks up the A, the swinging branch, and the cat. It picks up both, okay? As, as stupid and as simple as that. Now, this uh, not being a, a friendly uh, piece of technology is not gonna eat the branch and the cat, it's going to turn on the light. So if you have a cheap motion detector in your garden, whenever the branch moves, whenever a cat or the neighbor's cat is passing by at night, the light goes on. I do not recommend buying that. You should have a better uh, motion detector. Suppose that uh, not only there's uh, the swinging branch, the uh, cat, but there's also a stone. That's this organism with only one uh, sense, this motion detector that can only perceive whether something does or does not move, pick up the stone. No. More dramatically, the world is made of only cats and branches that move or don't, but the stone will never ever be part of any conceivable universe for that level of abstraction. It will be beyond the very idea that there might be something like a stone which never moves. Now, I'm assuming the stone doesn't move. Uh, of course, it could roll, it could be kicked, etc. But no, forgive me for the oversimplification. Now, let's move to the other level of abstraction. This plus here means that it turns on the light when both things happen. For the logicians among us, is an end uh, connection. Both values need to be satisfied. It moves and is emitting some kind of heat. Well, for this particular level of abstraction, the world is even more restricted. It's not richer, it's, if you like, poorer. This level of abstraction does not perceive the stone, like this one, because it doesn't move, but it doesn't perceive, A, the swinging branch, because that is not a source of infrared. This level of abstraction perceives only B. For this level of abstraction, the universe is made of only and uniquely 
entities that either move or don't move, but they can do both. So sometimes move, sometimes they don't, not like the stone, they never. Uh, and as well, uh, sources of infrared uh, waves. May or may not, but again, they may. At that point, for this level of traction, the, the light goes on only if the neighbor's cat is walking in your garden or someone you don't want to have. These are two spaces of abstractions. For L01, this space here is all there is in terms of space of observation, the space of abstraction. And for the other level of abstraction, this is the only space available. Neither detects the stone C. So I hope this is clear enough to un no, start grasping the, the fact that what we're building here, and I'll come back to this again and again uh, uh, in the, for the rest of this lecture and in the afternoon, uh, what we're building here is a specific kind of description of the world, the space of observation. is a description based on this side of the interaction, how we interact with the world, movement, movement infrared, you can make it way more complicated, and what comes out of that interaction. We're not trying to grasp what the world is in itself over and above these two levels of abstractions in a simple example we provide, or our means to collect waves of any kind, for example, signals of any kind. It is still signals. It might be infrared signals. So we might need an apparatus, a system, some kind of technology to get there. It may be radio, microwaves, etc. But something needs to capture, perceive, get that signal. Now, getting the signal doesn't mean getting the source of the signal. Let me just uh, add another metaphor, quite simply. Forget about everything we said so far. Imagine you're in your room, you're listening to uh, the radio, uh, and the radio is uh, transmitting some music, whatever music. What you are capturing is the music, not the nature of the source, which is the radio uh, behind the music. Now, it doesn't mean that the radio doesn't exist. Of course, there is a radio station sending signals, but what you get are the signals, not the source. This was very clear, not in these terms, uh, of course, to Kant. Uh, we saw this uh, last week. But any anyone like Hegel, remember the three H, Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, who is trying to get to the source by looking at the signal, is attempting virtually the impossible. How much could you possibly tell me about, say, the real ultimate nature of the radio station by listening to Beethoven or any rock music you like, you like Pink Floyd, just to show my age? Well, surely um, there is the assumption that there is a radio station um, transmitting, but the nature of the, uh, the radio station, who is there, how many, where they are, what they're doing, uh, what kind of apparatus or systems, etc. But it's all uh, unreachable and perfectly fine. There's no need to be um, too skeptical about the existence of the source, but we need to understand what kind of world, and out of metaphor, what kind of world, back to this example, we can build by having a variety of level of abstractions that pick up different kinds of signals from their space of observation. Once you have this uh, perspective, then the next step is to understand that, therefore, the ontology that we are building, remember ontology, theory of the reality out there, is epistemological. I hope this is not confusing. Epistemology, theory of knowledge, theory, if you like, uh, for someone like me, of uh, a certain uh, specific kind of information, well, it is because we have a epistemological understanding of our modeling of the system that we get a particular model or models of the system out there. This epistemological ontology, um, I need to warn you, is something you hear in this course, but not um, in your ordinary uh, introduction to metaphysics or introduction to ontology. Those books will try to uh, bypass the need for modeling, design, level of abstractions, signals versus source, etc., and will try to tell you what the world is in itself 
of and above anything that is between you and the world. In other words, they will try to tell you what A and B and C are there in the space of observation, eliminating any need for a level of abstraction, which is another way of asking, if you remember last week, the ultimate price of the car without telling me what currencies are you using, whether it's dollar, euros, etc. Not very helpful, and indeed anyone's game. More on this in a moment, but we need to proceed, therefore, to uh, the next step. So this, to summarize, there are two ways of existing for the sensors. Something exists as an interaction, change movements, etc., and something exists as a bearer of a property. Let me show you uh, back this. C does not exist for either of the two level abstractions. A and B exist for number one because they bear a particular property. They move. And they interact with this particular sense, in that sense. B, and only B, exists for number two because it bears that particular property and interacts with the sensor in a particular way. So having a particular property and or interacting with the observer of that property is what it means to have existence in a space of observation. I show you this before, so just a reminder, you can tell that uh, with this perspective, our bodies, uh, the bodies of the two ladies here uh, in question, are just interfaces for the rest of the world. By having the body we have, our commonsensical uh, view of the world builds a specific ontology made normally of objects, colors, movements, sounds, uh, heat, um, taste, smell, etc., and that's the world as we perceive it. So step number one, it doesn't mean there is no world out there. Of course there is. That's the source of the signals that we pick up. But it does mean that we pick up some signals and we model those signals in a way that projects this particular view of, for example, that city. So, moving on, the coin interfaces that we are organize, shapes, cut reality into things and their properties. We tend to look at change, which is the third element you are missing here. Something like uh, a car has some properties, a color, four wheels, etc., etc., and it does something, moves from A to B. Now, these three elements are the elements through which we normally build any ontology. Uh, remember, we are now in the epistemological side of ontology. We are creating, designing, building models of systems. A pen has a particular color. Uh, it's a thing. It's red and it writes. This particular ontology can be replaced. You might be wondering, and we already had uh, almost an hour conversation, where the digital comes. No, it's a lot of philosophy so far, but there is no digital input yet. Well, what is going to happen in the rest of our, our lecture is that the digital is trying to, not really forcing, but gently nudging us towards a different understanding of our epistemological ontology. In more powerful terms, is re-ontologizing our reality. And I really, really hope I'm not being uh, obscure or confusing here. So one step back and bear with me, I'd rather repeat than lose anybody uh, in this uh, lecture. There's a world out there called the system. The system sends a variety of signals of all kinds. We look at sounds and, and uh, uh, waves, but it could be anything else. Heat, for example, etc. We, uh, or any apparatus uh, you wish, uh, any system, uh, biological or not, picks up some signals, models those signals to make sense of the source of those signals. So it models the, uh, the uh, um, uh, system in a variety of ways. How you model that, uh, that system happens at a certain level of abstraction. The level of abstraction is another way of just saying there is a bunch of 
type variables that you are picking up or simplifying is an interface that picks up certain kind of signals but not others and puts them together in a way that makes sense when it comes to the source. So to exist for something out there means to be subject to modeling at a level of abstraction with some kind of signals. Erase the signals, eliminate the model, forget about the level of abstractions, and nothing is there that can be perceived in the first place, picked up, assumed to be there independently of us, whether we perceive it or not. We stop here for a moment, put this away. What follows, therefore, is that we as particular organisms are cognitive interfaces that cut reality into certain specific kinds of things. We like to perceive, uh, we tend to perceive our, put more biologically, our mammalian brain, the brain we have as mammals, uh, uh, who have a lot to share with uh, the next chimpanzee, uh, perceive the world as made of things, objects, stuff, property of things, and changes of things, interactions, processes, etc. These are the three boxes. Just to remind you, there's a pen, some thing, it has a particular color and shape, properties, and it does something, it writes. Once you have this, the digital, and is the rest of the lecture here, is gently modifying how we capture this and is shifting our perception of the world from being made of things first, then properties, then processes, into a universe that is made of relations, meaning properties, interactions, processes, which lead to things. This should be obscure at the moment. Don't worry, I'll spend another 15 minutes clarifying it. And at the end of this 15 minutes, I hope it will be quite obvious. It was just an introduction to the following slides. So this is how we perceive the world uh, from a mammalian classic perspective. And uh, forgive me, but this is how you do metaphysics when you have no level of abstractions and no actual reflection. From Aristotle all the way to the three H, remember, uh, the world is made of stuff. We can call that the primacy of things. And it leads to a mechanistic philosophy behind your philosophy. That all philosophy is just a fancy way in German to uh, speak about the philosophy that precedes the philosophy, the philosophy that is informing the philosophers. Let me oversimplify and be unfair to three absolutely geniuses uh, uh, of all times, the three H, I told you, uh, the Hegel, the uh, Husserl, and the Heidegger of the world. For those uh, sort of uh, amazing uh, philosophers, the world is uh, starts with something. And the old philosophy behind that is, with a big stretch, a big mechanistic. A mechanism is different from a network. More on this as we progress through the following uh, slides and lectures. It's a very simple distinction, one more that you need to have your bag of tools, and once you grasp it, we'll never leave you because it's obvious. A mechanism is like a car, for example, uh, is something that is made of, made up uh, of other things. Wheels, for example, engine, a chassis, um, gears, windscreens, etc. But each of those objects is existent in and of itself. If you look at the world from a mechanistic perspective, you look at the world as something that is made of things that make other things. A watch is made of uh, little bits, each of which is independent and exists in and of itself. A wall is made of bricks. There are bricks and there are walls. A society is made of individuals. Individuals 
get together into communities, families, parties, uh, interest groups, uh, companies and um, political uh, parties and ministries, uh, agencies and so on. So you have this very atomistic, quite intuitive view that has been with us since Democritus onwards. Um, the big is made of the small and the small is made of smaller and every atom uh, and every molecule exists in and of itself. That's a mechanism. The properties of the mechanism may be just inherited from the properties of the elements that make up the mechanism or emerge by the interactions between the bits that put together make the mechanism, the system. Great. We've been thinking that way and we think that way every day. That's the normal way of thinking. In fact, if you look at a company, that's the way you organize a company. All their units, the units are made of uh, smaller units, maybe they're people, individuals, and usually there's a pyramid, there's a hierarchy. Now, why is this completely different from a network? Because a network doesn't have elements that come together and make up the network. You don't have nodes that then you link to make sure that there are you know, elements like relations between node A and node B. If you think in terms of networks, you think, first of all, holistically of the whole network. And it is the relations that make up the nodes. So instead of talking about citizens and then citizenship, you talk about citizenship and participation in or into citizenship. There are no Italian speakers and then Italian or English speakers and then English. There's English and then people who can speak that language or not. Like take myself, I right now I'm speaking English, but certainly English doesn't depend on me speaking it or not. I just participate in the activities of a community that is the English speaking community. So I have a network perspective of this particular node who qualifies or not as part of the network of English speakers, depending on whether it does or does not, and how well, now there's a threshold below which you don't really are an English speaker, and a threshold above which, etc. So if you look at the world from a, a mechanistic perspective, you have a top-down uh, kind of uh, agglomerate of bigger and bigger and bigger things, uh, Bigger things make even bigger things. And as you go on, um, every element in the construction is independent. Remember, bricks make walls, walls make houses, houses make uh, districts or neighborhood, neighborhood make a city, the city makes except and you build out there. But if you have a network perspective, you normally work top down. More holistically, there's a network, there's participation in that network, the relations come first, the nodes are made by the relations, and I will give you some metaverse you know, a bit more intuitive in a moment. And in order to understand the nature of the node, you need to understand the relations that make up that node. In other words, uh, as Hume uh, uh, said uh, a long, long time ago, we are a bundle of many things. Could be emotions, um, could be, uh, you know, depending on whether you are more or, or less human, uh, many other bundle of, but we are a bundle. A bundle isn't something in and of itself. It's a collection of things. Uh, Wittgenstein has another beautiful metaphor. Uh, he uh, talks about um, uh, artichokes. Uh, I think it was artichokes. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm confused and I, and I speak about salad, but I think it was uh, the artichoke. Once you take away all the leaves of the artichoke, there is no artichoke there. Now, if you look in terms of to the world, in terms of things first, property of things, and then interactions. Uh, linguistically, if you are Indo-European, that comes very natural to you. There are nouns, there are adjectives, and there are verbs. Nouns first, car, quote unquote. Adjective, red. Is moving, verb. Our language naturally models reality in that way. Well, then you are moving uh, in the direction of a mechanistic perspective, atomistic, bottom up, individual first, individual make communities, communities, etc. But if you look at the world from the so artichoke perspective, the human perspective, the bundle, the artichoke, there is no ultimate hook there where all the properties can be attached. If you scratch the world, at the end of it, 
remember we're doing a epistemological modeling of the world, our epistemological modeling of the world doesn't have to be things first. It could be relations first. And that is exactly, in my view, where the digital revolution is gently nudging towards. We are, and I will show you uh, more in a moment, increasingly led to think in terms of network, not mechanism, in terms of relations, not relator, and therefore the primacy or primacy of relations rather than things. The world looks very differently from that perspective. Let me give you another example, which is from political theory. I have used this more than once, so uh, forgive me. But the beautiful, amazing uh, beginning of the American Constitution is staggering. Is a, is a network perspective, not a mechanistic perspective, because it starts by saying we the people. It doesn't say me, you, John, Peter, Mary, Laura. Blah, blah. No, it's just we the community, we the network. It doesn't say we the gazillions of people who coming together like atoms make up uh, a whole world. Now, if you read Margaret Thatcher, on the other hand, and I know I. I, I if you want to know more about this, this is all in the green and the blue, the, that, that particular book. She is well known, famous for saying there is no such thing as society, that only individuals. Individuals make society. Individuals do this, do that, take care, etc., have interests and so on. So it's a completely mechanistic, atomistic, bottom-up perspective. And I think it's wrong. And I think the digital uh, culture and the digital revolution is helping us to see how um, well, wrong is, is a strong word, as I said, we want to be pluralist, how limited, how unhelpful, how much better it is, in fact, to think in terms of network rather than mechanism, in terms of uh, relations rather than relator, not looking at the world atomistically, but in a sort of holistic way. Now, hol holistic has a bad uh, sort of press, bad fame. Uh, basically, it looks like something that is, uh, everything is connected to everything, oh my goodness, not, not necessarily, not true. That's why we need uh, the methodology that I introduced uh, last week and today in terms of level abstraction. We can be very precise and very analytic, even if we assume a more holistic perspective of the world. So moving on, what does that do to our system and models uh, perspective? This is something that we covered uh, during last week, so I will be rather quick um, as a reminder. Remember this picture? This is the world out there. We analyze the world at different, a huge variety, in fact, a boundless variety of level abstractions for a boundless reasons, purposes. Maybe because I this is the underground, I want to navigate the underground. I want to fix the underground. I want to know how much does it cost to build a new track of the underground. Different purposes, different level abstractions. They generate a particular model of their system that identifies features called a structure of their system. By now, this uh, I do this a few times, so you get acquainted with this, but this should be very familiar. Um, what we call the system in itself in philosophy comes from Kant, this Kantian terminology. Kant speaks of the noumenon, or the, in German, Ding an sich, the thing in itself. This is, for us, something that anchors, grounds our models at a level of abstraction for a purpose, but in and of itself, it is meaningless to describe. Remember, it's the ultimate price of a car without any currency. It doesn't make any sense. And it's not because you know, we are relativistic, but because we need to know for what reason you're developing that particular model. Now, this is, in Kantian terminology, the phenomenon. What you uh, get in terms of a particular kind of access to that system once you have the model for that purpose. So remember, this is a theory, uh, and everything you ever meet in science or everyday life uh, will be made of these components. There will be a purpose, a abstraction, a model abstraction, etc. I also told you that modernity is dominated by two conceptual logic of information, or if you like, two conceptual logic of a model. The model is what gives us information in terms of a structure about the system. Remember the model of the underground? Remember those two maps? Those two maps were the model, the information, in that case, a visual that I have picking up a certain kind of structure of the underground. Now, this modeling has been dominated in modernity by these two great philosophers and great thinking, Kant and Hegel. Kant 
with his transcendental logic, picks up the conditions of possibility of the system. The system is there. Imagine uh, the stars, uh, a black hole, uh, the solar system. Uh, the, you could be doing biology, um, the animal kingdom, analyze at a particular level of abstraction, generates a model, etc. And it tells you how did it happen? How is it possible that that thing is there? Now, this conditions of possibility, Kant makes them uh, increasingly epistemological. Well, we perceive the system in that particular way because that's the way we are built, oversimplifying. The other logic is the dialectical logic provided by Hegel, and it tells you what are the conditions of stability of that system. How come that the system would be in question like a society, for example, or a, pol a political um, context, uh, a war um, is not entirely no, exploding, but keeps going through different equilibria. Well, these are the conditions of stability, stability that are dialectical logic between A and B and C and A and B and C uh, enable us to understand the system in question. Once again, the system is there. You find it in the world and you try to understand it. So back here, we have uh, these two kind of logics. One looks at uh, the world as uh, given uh, and looks at the conditions of possibility of that world is very much in line with causal thinking. Obviously, how does what does it take for that to be there? How did it happen? How come that that is there? Actually, this other one is much more in line with uh, anything that's got to do with equilibria and therefore normally in social sciences, now uh, economics, um, jurisprudence, uh, game theory political theory or uh, political philosophy, etc. Uh, it is not accidental that when you try to do uh, uh, to develop a Kantian conditions of possibility analysis of social systems, mm, it doesn't work very well. And when you try to do a Hegelian condition of stabi stability uh, analysis of physical system, it doesn't work very well. In fact, it's quite ridiculous when you find people of uh, the Hegelian Marxian uh, perspective trying to develop uh, a Marxist physics, a Hegelian physics, a Marxist biology, etc. It's all over the place, it's a mess, it's ridiculous. You're just applying the wrong level of abstraction for the wrong uh, reasons uh, in the wrong way. So the model comes out as a complete mess. There is a design logic, which we don't find in modernity, and which I introduced uh, last week. This design logic is not assuming that a system is there. It wants to build a system, create a system. It therefore looks at the model as something that picks up the conditions of feasibility. It's not about equilibrium. And it's not about causal, transcendental conditions of possibility. It's more about is this possible given the constraints and the affordances and the purpose we are pursuing, et cetera, et cetera, when we want to build that system. If you find that this is a little bit complicated, uh, remember this was the picture in the past uh, and we covered this quite extensively. So once we have this, we have a theory, we have three different ways of developing a logic of modeling, the Kantian, the Hegelian, and the design, then we have two immense advantages. A theory is committed to a particular existence. This is going to be slightly difficult to explain by choosing that level of abstraction. Once you have chosen that level of abstraction, then you commit yourself a second time by accepting the resulting model of that level of abstraction. Let me try to do this, which I know is going to be a bit difficult to digest, by looking at the super simple model we had here. What is the commitment, as in I strongly believe that the world is made in such and such way. I believe that this exists, that what we call ontological commitment. It comes from Quine, 
uh, I think is the, one of the first, if not the most, certainly the most famous, if not the first to formulate that particular concept. If you um, embrace a theory, that theory tells you that the world is such and such, is in this way rather than another. So by embracing, accepting, adopting a theory, any theory, uh, biological, scientific, or of any kind, uh, from chemistry, from um, uh, jurisprudence, from economics, uh, from anthropology, and an ethnographic theory of whatever you're talking about, that system, not only you are embracing a particular epistemological view, i.e. knowledge related view of that system, you're also committing yourself, at least implicitly, to assume, accept that that's the way the world is. They say, oh look, I accept that the world, by embracing level abstraction one, the world is made of branches swinging and cats walking. At the same time, implicitly, without even knowing, the, this is an unknown unknown, I'm also assuming that they, there are no stones in my world. Of course, if I use the other level of abstraction, I'm, the ontological commitment is in favor of B, the existence of B. How do I get this ontological commitment? By choosing the level of abstraction. So if you like, we are embodied as cognitive interfaces. We are embodied ontological commitments to a world that has sounds and colors and heat and movement and it's made of things above all, and then a property of things, and, and then changes of these uh, things and, uh, and properties. That is, by default, what we are committed to by having, a, in a sort of evolutionary sense, this particular body. So this is advantage number one. We understand that by embracing a theory, we commit ourselves to accept one, the dead level of abstraction. Imagine that I embrace the theory that, in terms of common sense, the world is full of colors. Well, that I'm choosing that level of abstraction. I'm committing myself to that level of abstraction. And then, as a result, the output of that level of abstraction, that particular model that shows uh, the world outside my window as green and blue and yellow, etc., or full of sounds, or uh, full of things that I can bump into. Okay, so this is advantage one, fundamental. But there are two more that are equally fundamental. This, sorry, to conclude, this particular advantage enables us to compare different models. And uh, we can decide that one is better than another. Now, imagine different example. You want to buy a car. First of all, you commit yourself to a particular kind of car. For example, you want to buy a Polo. And then you buy that specific car. And that is your second commitment. Your commitment to the type, I'm going to buy a Polo, and then you buy that specific car, that system. And that's commitment number two. I said there are more advantages uh, of this perspective, um, of having a, an epistemological ontology. First of all, and this is a, a no, centuries old, millennia old problem in philosophy. We have control over the logical priority of what comes first and what comes next. It's the chicken and egg um, problem. Now, I'll, I'll be back to, to this uh, uh, in a few slides uh, with a chicken and egg picture, so you will find it. But let me focus on this uh, for a moment. Imagine someone, as usual, philosophy class, day one, year one, etc. And he says, oh, what comes first? Uh, the chicken or the egg? Mind that question. What is missing in that question? There is no level of structure. It's an absolute question. Absolute question, absolute mess. You can't get out. It's wrongly formulated. There's nothing you can do about it. But imagine that that question is not asked at the system level. Is the world in itself made of chicken first or egg first or vice versa but you ask at the modeling level well at that point you can actually decide what comes first and what comes next and in fact in terms of nice order i would like to say well you know it's first the egg the egg grows makes a chicken chicken makes it so how do you decide what's oh, the model i can i can simply decide that my model will put in place 
eggs first and then the chicken. Oh, I can do it the other way around. I have the freedom of a modeling perspective as opposed to having the burden of a metaphysical view of the world in itself that forces me to say, Luciano, I don't want to hear about purpose or anything. I want to know the world in itself. Remember the Kantian Ding and Sikh, the noumenon. Is it made of eggs first or chicken first? No way out. Impossible to answer. We just got into the wrong corner. We need to get out of that corner. That is not a problem to solve. It's an uh, uh, antinomy to avoid. So, huge advantage, number one. An epistemological ontology, because it's design-based, enables you to have control on the logical priority of relations over the relator. Or in this case, for example, the logical order of the chicken and the egg. Then you can compare, as I said a moment ago, you can compare different models with regard to the purpose. So you can look at your truth as a way of being correct in giving an answer to that question. But the question comes first. If you ask the question, is the chicken or the egg that comes first? I want to know, okay, at what level of abstraction, for what purpose? Or for modeling purposes, or for modeling purposes, we will establish that the egg comes first. Okay, fine. There's nothing we can do about it over and above just assuming that that is good enough for our modeling purposes. So um, in terms of fitting the purpose that we have in mind, an epistemological ontology, modeling first uh, and talking about the system, enables to tell you who is right and who is wrong. Now, one of the things that you will find frustrating if you read Hegel and then Husserl and then Heidegger and all the followers is that you can never ever find a way of saying I disagree. And I'm not talking about saying something right or wrong, proving, uh, showing for good and once and for all by evidence based reasoning. I'm even talking about, look, what are the reasons? Remember open questions. What are the reasons in favor and one against? Where is the alternative view that I could assume if I were to disagree with you? Why? Because there are narratives. And the narrative is about the ultimate nature of the system. There are level of abstraction free zones. In a level of abstraction or abstraction free zone area, anything flies. So it's a matter of faith. Ultimately, you become a Hegelian or a Husserlian or a Heideggerian because you believe or you don't believe. You find it, for example, um, convincing in an overwhelming way, intuitively, it speaks to your emotions maybe, or uh, you find it that is um, closer to other things you believe, so it's coherent with your worldview. But in terms of ability to disagree, in other words, are these uh, three sort of great philosophers empowering me in such a way that I can say, look, your level of instruction, your purpose is different from mine and mine is better. We should not, for example, um, uh, model the universe as being capital B. It, to me, doesn't make sense for such and such reasons, etc. So can we have a dialogue in which we exchange reasons or can we not? The space of exchanging reasons has been adopted as a principle to do philosophy, or have we bypassed that? Well, of course, these philosophies have bypassed that. In other words, they say, look, no, uh, this is also part of the problem. We should be talking about the, no, the, the uh, reality in itself, etc., etc. I'll leave it to you, because I adopt that particular kind of philosophy, to see whether this is preferable or not. I find it, of course, uh, coherent with space of uh, reasons giving and uh, exchanging reasons convincing and convincing for what uh, particular reasons and purposes. And therefore, following that Kantian perspective, um, I think that it makes much more sense. It's much more advantageous uh, to try to uh, understand the universe from a modeling perspective and therefore develop a epistemological ontology, not a metaphysical one, a one that bypasses any particular uh, level of abstraction and seeks to understand the world in and of itself. Now, if we uh, can uh, have had enough here, I think this is a good place where to stop. Um, let me just add one more remark. 
what will follow uh, this afternoon uh, will be what I anticipated. In other words, given this synthesis so far, um, we're talking about how do we understand the world and ourselves, ontology, the interactions that we have with the world, epistemology, and the interactions we have among ourselves, well, that not politics, ethics, uh, pragmatics, how the digital is reshaping one, two, three, and four. Next step, we are focusing on reshaping our perspective, understanding, and grasping of the world. Put it more dramatically, we are trying to understand how digital, uh, the digital revolution is re-ontologizing our understanding of the world, changing the ontology that we have as a default, as the philosophy behind the philosophy. I told you that these days we have a gap to um, uh, close, uh, a tension to address, which is the commonsensical ontology, which is the one that we, we have when walking down the, the road. Uh, the world is such and such, because that's the way we perceive it, um, and a scientific ontology, which tells us that the world is incredibly different from the way we perceive it in terms of uh, signals, movement, etc. Et How do we recompose this? Well, we recompose it through the adoption of different level abstractions. This that we just introduced, the commonsensical and the scientific, and it could be others, for example, a religious uh, level abstraction, uh, ways of looking at, analyzing, more precisely, modeling the system assuming a different level of abstraction for a different purpose. If your purpose is to navigate from here to there uh, today and catch a bus, you better have a commonsensical level of abstraction because science will not help you. But if you need to uh, crash some uh, subatomic particles uh, against each other, well, surely uh, common sense will not help you there at all. Uh, you better do some serious um, uh, science and physics. At this point, we are trying to navigate between absolute views. The world is like this full stop, which could be philosophical, could be scientific, could be commonsensical. And mind that we have had in the history of thinking, we have had people defending a absolute view of uh, the universe, uh, commonsensically, an absolute view scientifically of the world, uh, and a absolute metaphysical view of the world. Now, Hegel, uh, Husserl, and Heidegger come to mind. Well, we're trying to navigate between these absolute views and the totally uh, skeptical, relativistic, or anything goes, and the opposite of anything, it's just a story, it's all fabricated, it's all an invention, it's all up to us, it's all social construction, you might have heard this, there is no such thing as reality, there is no such thing as uh, science, it's all a narrative, etc, etc. Well, this also is hugely unconvincing. It might be that we cannot escape this dichotomy, the absolute versus the completely uh, relative. But in the middle, surely we need to look for some space where we have sufficient pluralism to make space for different views of the world, but not so much that these views are any views and they are not comparable. So we restrict the number of views. Some are definitely insane. Uh, some are completely unreliable, uh, meaningless. So we have a set of views that make up roughly the pluralistic view that we want to discuss, and we can compare them among themselves, not in absolute terms, but in terms of do they, uh, do they address the purpose for which they have been developed. Back to the original point, we have the underground in London. We want to have a series of different maps, but not every map will work. Relativism is going to make a complete mess of our journey or our needs to fix the underground or I'll need to build a new rail track or I'll need to uh, say uh, close one and uh, di divert all uh, passengers on another etc whatever the purpose is so there is a, a set of maps that are okay and not pluralism but others are completely uh, useless and within that set they are comparable it is not true that all oh, it's a limited relativism uh, relativism, relativism limited to just say 5, 10, 15, uh, 27 maps of the London Underground, but any, any of them is as good as any other. Not true, because as good as depends on 
what for. This is the point that I introduced towards the end of the uh, hour and a half we spent together. The what for enables you to commit yourself to a particular way in which the world is described relative to that theory or that way of sort of modeling the world. So it makes your ontological commitment explicit. It does enable you to adopt a modeling solution to the chicken and egg kind of, uh, problem. In other words, the priority in which you treat the elements that you are using to build the model of the system. If the system is analyzed in and of itself, then there's nothing else but to say something comes first and something comes later. The logical order has to be the metaphysical order. That's Hegel, for example. But if it is up to us, because of the level of structure and the purpose, to decide which model fits for that particular purpose, that system, then we decide the model coming, for example, from a egg first perspective, because that makes more sense in that context. We could build a, a we could no, imagine literally a pencil and a piece of paper, and I'd ask you to design, draw the um, London Underground. Do you start with a line and put two railway stations at each side of their line, or you start from dots and you link them through uh, lines? It's up to you. Why? Because you're modeling. You're not doing something that uh, needs to capture the intrinsic nature of the system, which, as I remind you, is like a radio station sending signals. We work with the signals. We have no idea about the radio station behind the signals. That's a metaphor. I hope it's sufficiently clear. So the advantage of a epistemological ontology is the emphasis on the modeling. No relativistic, no absolutist. It's pluralist. And it's a pluralism that enables rational debate in terms of better or worse. The model of the underground will be many, many models comparable, depending on whether they are more or less fit for purpose. There is a point behind all this, which is the shift from a mechanistic, atomistic view of our ontology, trying to capture what the world is in itself, one way or another, to a more network relational perspective. This shift is increasingly uh, justified, gently nudged in our own pre-philosophical, underground cultural way of thinking. To put it in a way that is horrible, so forgive me, new generations, a horrible way of speaking, will be thinking more naturally in terms of networks than in terms of mechanisms. Why? Because we live in a world that th where the digital gently uh, invites us to think in that way rather than the other. So instead of thinking in terms of nodes that we then link with uh, arches, for example, we will be thinking in terms of arches and relations and then po point at the end of those arches and relations, nodes as constituted by those relations. I mentioned Hume, I mentioned Wittgenstein, there will be other, uh, others to be mentioned in the following uh, slides for the rest of this uh, lecture. But I want to stop here because we have about 20 minutes of questions. So I'll uh, stop uh, sharing this. We will uh, reconvene and make more progress with this lecture in the afternoon, two o'clock Italian time. But at this stage, we have some time for Q&A. So I'll stop sharing. We're still recording, uh, so I remind everybody to be careful what you're saying. Uh, uh, you will be on record, uh, as they say, please smile or at least say something nice. Uh, and uh, the floor is open to anyone who wants to ask any question or any clarification. I know there was a lot to digest, so let me know if something is unclear. Happy to go through those points. Some of them are not entirely intuitive. Yes, Raphael. Um, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, my question, um, well, may maybe I could wait for the next lecture, but um, I, I would like some uh, uh, a more uh, um, explanation in the sense of the network uh, relation. I, I, I can uh, grasp, I can uh, uh, understand 
the, the theory because uh, in the end, uh, the level of abstraction that leads to the model, in the end, it all begins with purpose. We need to clarify what for, uh, why things are, uh, how we approach the reality, how we understand and model the reality. Uh, but first we need to clarify what for we are doing uh, such and such things. And uh, the next step is uh, how, uh, I, I couldn't uh, understand quite well uh, the way like the approach of relations uh, since um, uh, everyone has his own uh, level of abstraction, everyone has his own way of uh, approaching the relations and how this can be more uh, clarified in that uh, theory of uh, understanding reality. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, no, thank you. Uh, it is something that we're going to cover this afternoon. So I'll, I'll show you uh, in one way, for example, even from a, a, an intuitive geometrical physics based perspective, we can see things emerging from relations. Now relations uh, are either fixed, as in uh, um, the distance between two points, or they can be dynamic, like a process, you know, someone shaking hands with someone else. Um, but uh, I, I speak about relations uh, no, to uh, make simple uh, and make sure that we have uh, the, the most simplified picture in front of us. Objects and something happen, happening between objects, or nodes and something happening between nodes. As you know, a graph, um, like uh, the graph of the underground, uh, but any other graph, could mean um, a lot of things with those arches between A and B. Uh, a and B could be Romeo and Juliet, and the graph, uh, the, the sort of the arch between Romeo and Juliet could be they love. Now that is a relation, uh, the relation of loving, uh, mutual in this case. Um, and the joke here, not so much, would be that there is no, there is no Romeo and there is no Juliet without their love. Um, less dramatically and less poetically, uh, but we'll see this in the next, uh, in this afternoon. Uh, if you want to picture mentally what a ontology, remember, epistemological kind, and we're not talking about the reality itself, no, something that we can um, work in terms of modeling the world looks like, is thinking in terms of roads and roundabouts. I use this example because it's I think it no, brings, as you were, uh, uh, more ammunition to my side, not relations first. But think about it for a moment. Imagine you need to build roads and roundabouts. What do you plan first? The roundabouts or the roads? Of course the roads. And it's where the roads meet that you have a roundabout. Now that roundabout is a node, a thing, an entity, a substance, an object whatever you want to call it, is absolutely real. There's nothing unreal in that node just because it was constituted, say, by three or four roads coming together. But it doesn't mean that it comes first logically. Logically, in our modeling, roads come first, and when they meet, you get a node. So in this sense, um, it helps. I just gave you an example to think in terms of network rather than mechanism. In a mechanistic view, you would have nodes, so roundabouts, and then build roads between the roundabouts, which would be quite insane. Um, there's more to be said about this. What I'm suggesting here is that, for example, in political theory, we should definitely shift from a Margaret Thatcher perspective, individuals, society, the only individual, no society, etc towards a, if you like, community-based, relational uh, approach to interactions. I gave you the example of citizenship. Now, in Italy, uh, no, given uh, where we are giving these lectures, at least virtually for the moment, the debate about citizenship is huge because of the uh, migrant uh, issue. It, it makes an immense difference, conceptually and in terms of consequences. If you think in terms of citizenship as coming first. That's the network, the relationship. And then individuals, you, me, anybody, partaking, becoming one node in that, being brought into that relationship. 
So look at the politicians and see whether they, when they talk about the problem of citizenship, do they start with citizenship or they start with citizens? And I have to say that uh, if you are a bit more, say, central right oriented, slightly more conservative, you will be going down the road of Margaret Thatcher. Individuals, citizens first. Can someone become a citizen, etc.? That discourse, you can understand it way better from a mechanistic perspective. But you can also say, look, there's an alternative view here. You could actually be talking about citizenship, the network, the way in which we participate, for example, in a language, in a community. And it doesn't come, not me first and the community. It's not Luciano first and then. I was born into a community. I was born into a citizenship. I was born into a language. Now, of course, I'm an individual. Remember, the roundabout is a roundabout. Don't, after this lecture, don't go through a roundabout like, oh, the, <laughs> Luciano said it, they don't exist. Boom, they're totally real. But they come second in terms of logical order. So if citizens are second in terms of logical order with respect to citizenship, you have a completely different debate about who can partake, participate, become a member or not. It's not you and me deciding whether Emmy can join us, but it's rather all of us you know, being part of a community and wondering whether Emmy is part of that community, but not because of me, because of you, because of someone else. It's not like citizens versus non-citizens, but it's everybody around this participation in a community. Now, I hope this a couple of examples show enough in terms of this makes a big difference. It's not just a uh, no, philosophical hair splitting here. And there is more to be said about this, uh, especially once, but not today. In fact, it will be for the lecture on complexity. When we start understanding that the complexity that we uh, are facing today is not a complexity of atoms and interactions between atoms and mechanistic complexity, is a complexity at a network level, is a top down complexity. So it's a complexity where the whole network is involved, not just you, me, Emmy, or anyone else, and then see whether we can do anything. Final remark, when you hear people saying, what can I do to do this and that and that, it's praiseworthy. It's a good instinct, but it's not enough because it's the view that I, the atom in this big mechanism, can make a difference with my atomic action. My atomic action is totally useless. My short shower will not save the world. It doesn't matter. I need to take a short, a short shower, not, not eat meat, uh, walk, etc., because it's the right thing to do in and of itself, not because it's useful. That's another story. We will uh, face this uh, at a different context. But if it's not because it's useful, what becomes useful? Well. We need to drop the mechanistic, atomistic view. We need to work at the network level, et cetera, et cetera. So as a community, et cetera. So it's by um, working on the whole citizenship, the whole political uh, context that you make a difference. Final, final comment, and uh, I've got uh, the more uh, hands to uh, address um, up. You might have heard, it's a, it's a Latin phrase, but it's very common even in English, uh, that politics takes care of the uh, uh, res publica, the public thing. It doesn't. Remember, this is not the right ontology, no more. It's not the res, R-E-S, the thing that politics takes care of. Politics takes care of the ratio, R-A-T-I-O, which in Latin also means balance. Uh, that's why the rational numbers are called rational, not because there's anything non-rational about them, but it's a, a relationship between. And so playing with, with words is the ratio publica, the interactions and the connections between all the elements that need to be taken care of. You want to fix the roundabout, you need to fix the roads. If that roundabout doesn't work, it's because the roads are not working. There's nothing you can do about, say, uh, the roads by working on the roundabouts. If citizenship doesn't work, it's not because the, the, the citizens don't work. It's the other way around. So you start per per perceiving the world really in a different uh, way, which I think is uh, better, preferable these days. But remember, that's the last uh, side comment, uh, really. Um, 
it's just a matter of uh, rational preference. Uh, dialectical discussion where ultimately you know, we might be of different views uh, and, and convinced by each other. I think that this picture makes more sense than the other picture, that the uh, uh, relational ontology uh, of an epistemological kind, etc., design and so on, is way more in line with what we're discussing today. But uh, stop here because I, I see more hands and uh, back to Amy. Uh, yes, Josie, you had your hand up first. Uh, sorry, maybe this question would be a little generic uh, since we are talking about having a purpose every time we um, have a question. But um, my simple question was about, um, you know, I see some uh, links with Dr. Turner's theory of uh, Latour. I don't know if it's related or it's my imagination. Uh, so it was just a curiosity just to dive in. Thank you. Now, this is a very, very good point. Uh, is um, there is a strong relation um, with uh, Ant, uh, as people call it. Um, uh, at some point, it was very popular um, to have, especially in my department. Uh, Amy uh, and I share the same uh, provenance uh, from the Oxford Internet Institute back in Oxford. It was very popular to write master theses using uh, Ant, the uh, uh, Latour's um, approach to. Uh, actor network uh, theory um, to model uh, master thesis. Um, the difficulty, and you find more uh, of a discussion uh, about this in, uh, for anyone interested, I can send you more references, uh, but there's something in, in, as in, in the book. Uh, the problem with the uh, action network theory is that um, the actor network theory takes actors as uh, logically prior. I hope, no, it, first of all, it's very difficult to understand exactly what Latour means by that theory, which is a great way of putting forward the theory. Basically, anyone can have a, a, a great game in understanding one way or another. Um, it, I say this as, as a criticism. Uh, if you are sufficiently vague, people will love uh, the theory because they can uh, do whatever they want with it. That was one of the problems with the master thesis at my, in my institute. Essentially, this method, quote unquote, was used to do anything in the opposite entity, but so be it. The difficulty, once you nail down what exactly, not so much Latour, but interpreters of Latour who have spent an enormous amount of time and energy trying to make sense of what exactly this ant uh, is, um, well, you discover that in uh, the actor network theory, actors come first. That is terrible. It's exactly the opposite of what I said so far. It's still the idea that roundabouts come first. It's so modern, as in subjects first, individual first, the I first. Remember the age of the I I told you last week? It's me, 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 because I'm worth it. Now, I'm not surprised, not Latour in a way is a very conservative thinker in uh, despite of the appearances. Uh, not, I mean, philosophically speaking, it comes from that tradition. And it's also you not know, building on his work that you can go further. So more positively and constructively is because if you like Latour had already uh, broken some ground that we can go much further than that and try to see is the world really in need of actors first and then you know, a network where those actors who could be anything that is the advantage with, uh, of the theory an actor could be for example a bureaucracy uh, so there's a much more open-minded view of agency something that i've also uh, inherited um, and i certainly want to embrace even further but suppose a network made of uh, bureaucracy artificial agents humans, communities, uh, etc. How do you model that? Do you model that in terms of actors first and then interactions, links, properties, or uh, actors comes later? If we're still stuck with actors first, then we haven't made it to the other side. It's just another way of reframing, more enlightening, uh, more open-minded, a mechanistic view of the, of the world. We are still stuck with Margaret Thatcher, which may sound quite surprising given not Latour's uh, orientation, but it is atomistic, it is individualistic, it's bottom up, actors first, and then the networks. Now, this is what I have, and this is a real confession, is what I have understood by reading Latour and above all reading people who know about Latour and try to uh, explain uh, in you know, some kind of plain English what this ant is. I might be completely wrong. So if I'm wrong, 
then Latour and I are really on the same page. If I'm right, then Latour is still on the other side of the, this divide between mechanism, network, atoms first, then relations. Relata, no, what is related in Latin, relata first, actors first, and then relations. If you see things in this way, uh, either I'm on the same page of Latour, or if you like, I am presenting you the second chapter, uh, and Latour is chapter one, a step in the right direction, but not quite on the other side. But thank you, uh, that was really very helpful. I hope it helps other people who are acquainted with Latour's work. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for another one. Uh, celebrate mind. If you're there. Almost there. Um, does anyone in the room have a question? No questions here. No. Uh, I think that's uh, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, can we talk okay. so we'll very quickly and then uh, uh, we abandon Celebrating Mind and maybe uh, Celebrate Mind will, will join us again in the afternoon. We'll cover oh, yes. these um, questions. Yeah, my question, thank you very much for this um, lecture and yeah, they are fantastic. Yeah, I can see there is a, a philosopher that you probably forgot about it, which is Bentham the utilitarism i can see this is the major method of information coming from uh, cybernetics which is control and also the panopticon the data uh, observation yeah they just like um, yeah can i say like point of view I've got it, but maybe you will explain this more in the future and I will be happy to listen to it. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Um, so on, on Bentham and Panopticon, um, we will not probably cover much of that uh, point because uh, it was a topic that we covered in the past and um, I was trying to, to give lectures that are slightly different. Uh, privacy, um, the, uh, the uh, eye that sees uh, the eye, um, but Having said that, when we will uh, address the ontology of the self, how we understand ourselves, there will be a reference to those topics. Uh, but, but basically to Bentham, Panopticon, uh, and especially the what, it, what difference does it make when we see ourselves in other people's eyes um, and uh, this sort of mirroring of our own identity through uh, other people's uh, perspective. But uh, I'm afraid that that would be uh, more like a, a small reference in that lecture. Um, the bulk of the discussion, uh, panopticon, uh, privacy, um, uh, a society of control, as in not uh, the cybernetic sense of control, but the sort of uh, police control, uh, the more sort of uh, uh, Foucault-like uh, uh, legislate and control population, etc., will not be part of this course. Um, uh, and some of you might be uh, sort of relieved because we're covering already a lot. But thank you. That was very uh, an important reminder. I'm afraid we will not have enough time to cover that topic too. Having said that, there will be a few references. So I hope, Giuseppe, you will not be disappointed. Thank you. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, th I think we can stop here. Uh, I see people have already started leaving. Uh, it's almost lunchtime back in Italy. Uh, and wherever you are, have a good time. Uh, thank you so much to Emmy. Um, Emmy, I don't know if you can come back to again at two o'clock. Yes, I'll be back this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, that's super helpful. Uh, for everyone else who joined us too late, uh, a reminder, we are going to reconvene this afternoon at two o'clock when we will start with things and relations. Um, please uh, remember that uh, the lectures uh, will be online this week. Unfortunately, I have not been uh, able to receive my passport back from the American consulate, so I'm stranded in this island, uh, pity me, uh, and I can't wait to join you in Bologna for a gazillion reasons, but above all to share the same space with Amy and you in their room. Until then, uh, have a good break and I'll see you in a few hours. Thank you. I think at this point I'm going to stop the recording.